north and you know you're going to have to wag south. Yes, Josh. Go further north, further north, and wag south. The uh, at radiation is 60 therapeutics. All right, that's really good. That's I know my mic is on because you can hear me. We, we got it. We can hear you now. Shot. So we're, we're still broadcasting live. Yes, sir. Are you comfortable, sir? Shot. All right. Don't move your body. The surgery is going to go a lot better if you don't move. For those of you watching, uh, maybe you've not watched one of these surgeries before, but this is a live broadcast shot. We don't edit these. I don't believe in editing the truth. I think people should know whatever's going on. Um, so today we're going to be doing shot L34, L45, L5S1. Our patient has some pretty good scoliosis going on, so that's, it makes my job a little bit more difficult. But... I don't give up easy shot. That's the good news for him. I'm not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize his safety shot, but at the same time, I don't give up easy. But you can see the spine is rotated there. And we have, of course, facet enlargement. So I'm just taking my time and making sure I do this right shot. But you want to line up with the end plate of the bottom of what you're treating shot shot all right our lineup is pretty good on the lateral view no blood thinners right shot I'm going to come in just a little bit more lateral. Shot. Shot. So you're watching the very beginning of a Duke laser disc repair. And this is an endoscopic surgery shot where I'm going to go in and repair this gentleman's discs that are damaged. And I do that using a uh, an endoscope shot, but I haven't put the endoscope in yet. Right now we're just gaining access to the disc space shot. And the surgery is done transforaminal shot, which means we're actually going through the neuroforamen shot. Well, I can tell you very few surgeons in spine know how to do this surgery. Probably only if I had to guess, certainly less than 100 in the world know how to do this in the lower back shot. And that's out of probably at least 20,000 spine surgeons. Shot. And the reason why so few people know how to do the surgery is because it's number one, um, it's a newer technology, so it hasn't been taught everywhere yet. Shot. And you have to be basically fortunate to find someone to teach you. Shot. All right, let's get an AP and see where we are. So basically, surgeons are taught how to do surgery in something called residency. And residency is what you do after medical school everyone goes to medical school they, they're taught the same curriculum except their last two years they kind of mix and match things a little bit but basically it's looking good lateral basically your last year of medical school you kind of pick all right i want to do neurosurgery so i'll do a neurosurgery four week rotation maybe general surgery plastic surgery so there's a little bit of variation in med school but the real specialized training occurs during residency and that's where somebody like me goes to uh, a neurosurgery residency 
and we do seven years of neurosurgery. So I did that, and during that residency, nobody's being taught this technique. Where do you feel it? Where? How far down your leg? Okay. But not further. It doesn't shoot down to your foot? Okay, lay still. You're doing great, by the way. We're almost... We're doing good. We're, we're doing very well. Everything's okay. Shot? Uh, so L5S1 is by far the hardest disc to do, without a doubt. Shot? And um, I'll be honest with you, the 100 neurosurgeons or 100 spine surgeons in the world that do endoscopic surgery, they don't do L5S1. I'm one of the only ones that will do it because it's so hard to get to. All right, we need to have a little bit, let's see what we can do. I think we need to improve that just a little bit. Try wagging maybe two degrees south with my side. So the problem is this technology, this technique is not taught in residency. Other way, because the, the neurosurgeons in residency training programs and I'll give you an example. In the United States, there's 100 neurosurgery training programs. That's pretty good right there. And in those 100 neurosurgery training programs, the spine surgeon that works in those training programs shot, doesn't know how to do the surgery. So how can they teach residents how to do the surgery if they don't know how to do the surgery? And it's not uncommon, by the way, for faculty not to know how to do certain types of surgery and neurosurgery because the fact of the matter is neurosurgery is such an advanced field that you you can't have equal training everywhere it's not possible are you okay shot so I'm not able to get in to the back I need to I need to give me a wag release this and don't lock it shot shot Shot, shot, lock it there. All right, so if anything, we're hitting the t superior plate of S1. Shot. Dr. Duke, we have a viewer question. Sure. One of our viewer asks, why does the patient need to be awake during the lower back surgery? Um, because the transforaminal part of the surgery I'm doing right now, the patient should be awake for that so they can help me in case I'm, I want to make sure there's a very narrow window that I can put the needle in and they're going to tell me if I'm too high or too low or too, too much to the side. So I need their assistance. Shot. I'll try bringing it back again. See if I can't direct it a little bit more north. You're doing fine, sir. Just lay still. Shot. Mm, let's go AP. So you can see this patient has very collapsed discs for those of you who understand spine anatomy. I can tell you that the discs are about 90 to 95% collapsed. And everyone seems to think, okay, well, if your discs are, are that collapsed, you're gonna need a fusion done or something like that. But the, answer, the truth is you don't. I used to believe the same thing. All right, let's go back to a lateral. That's a good AP, by the way, I like that AP. Let's go back to a lateral. How's the patient doing? Good? Doing great. All right. All right. So we're right there. I can still probably access the disk space when the patient will be asleep. But I do want to try one more time just to navigate into that disk space so I can do my discogram shot. 
shot. Where do you feel that shot? In your butt. Okay, we're not we're not doing anything to your butt. I promise you that. Shot. Yeah, so 5-1 is just so collapsed. There's not even room to get a needle in, but uh, we're still going to keep this position shot because um, when he's asleep, I'll be able to, to do a little bit better and get in and fix it. So. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next level. You're doing great, by the way. You're not making my job easy, though, that's for sure. That's okay. I don't expect it to be. So we make, we make our incision. We're going to go ahead and place our second needle. Are you comfortable? Yeah. All right. Sean? All right, let's see it again. All right, that's pretty good. Shot. So a lot of times I can get all three discs done. If I'm doing three discs, I can get them done with one incision shot. And that's always my goal, is to try to do everything with one incision shot. And if I can't, I can't, and that's okay. I don't expect to, but I try to, because fewer incisions are always better. Shot. As long as you can get the job done safely. So that's the facet joint again. And he has really large facet joints. Shot. You feeling something there? Yeah, right. right there. All right. Shot. Yeah, because he's rotated, of course, it makes it a little bit more challenging. Shot. Shot. Are you able to see the fluoro shot, guys? Yes, sir. All right, good. Shot. 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 Where do you feel that? Huh? Oh, but where? Okay. Where? Oh, okay. Shot. 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 AP view. Okay. That's nice. We're just a little bit, again, deflected a little bit towards the superim plate of the bottom. All right, lateral. Otherwise, everything else looks good. You getting a yawn in there? All right.
Nothing wrong with a little yawn. Sean, that's it there. So what what makes this surgery challenging shot is obviously on patients where the disc base is collapsed or the spine is rotated or the the foramen is narrow shot with bones bone spurs and um or the facets are enlarged, the facet joints, which we have to go past shot. I think, uh, shot. Well, they seem to be lined up well with the end plates. Um, oh, by the way, and this patient has all of those conditions. Big facet, rotated spine, collapsed disc base, osteophytes. When I mean big facets, I mean arthritic hypertrophied facets. So his facet joints are probably three times the size of normal facet joints, and they grow back and lateral. They also grow medial and anterior, but the part that's hurting us is the back and lateral part. We have another question. Sure. A viewer asks, how many surgeries do you usually perform a week? Oh, it just depends. There's no set number. It could be one, it could be none, it could be five. Just depends on that week. There's uh just depends on what comes comes through the door, so to speak, you know? All right, well, we're gonna go for three, three, four next. Let's move north. Let's move your base north. How's our blood pressure? Are you gonna help him? Should be at 90s, okay? Should not be 120. There's nothing wrong with 120, but for the surgery there is. All right. 120 would be normal, but we don't want that for surgery. Shot. All right. Sorry about that. Shot. So this facet joint is a little irritated for him. We'll give him a little bit of numbing medicine. Have it ready. That's the only reason I'd be taking out the stylet, Luis. Shot. Is that it right there? Shot. 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 What? No, sir. Shot. We're just gaining access to your disk space, that's all. Shot. Yeah, this is going to be the worst part of the whole surgery, I believe. Shot. Shot. Shot.
That's one of your inflamed facet joints, shot. Where do you feel that? Shot. Sir, where do you feel it? Got it. Shot. 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 <sighs> AP. It's going to say, are we going to go three for three? So we were able to get our last needle into perfect position. That was the biggest disc, by the way. Had the most room. Um, the other two were very, very collapsed. Probably only a millimeter or two of space. So, of course, your needle is bigger than a millimeter. And the patient's awake. So he's going to be tightening down on his musculature, which collapses the disc space even more. Okay, I'm going to try one more time at, at 4 or 5 to get that into position a little bit better. Lateral view. Where's our blood pressure? <laughs> well, why would you not make sure you understood that ahead of time? I don't understand that. So what I'd like you to do is really you guys got to spend a little bit of time talking about these surgeries. There really aren't that many things to talk about, but blood pressure is one of the most important things. All right. So, shot. 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 Let's wag it a little bit. Wag my side down. Let's see what that does. Take a shot. I can't really tell if that improved it or not. I think it did. I think it made it better. See the vacuum space phenomenon, folks, on those discs at L45, L5S1? That's air in the disc. That's because the disc is so collapsed that now that he's laying down, he's a little bit more relaxed. His, his bones are spreading apart, and, and basically it's like a vacuum in there, like the vacuum of space. Ah, um, but that just indicates how badly collapsed his disc spaces are. Shot. So we're spending a little bit more time on this part of the surgery because obviously it's the most, I think, one of the most important parts of the surgery. Shot. Um, and you want to get it just right. Shot. Getting it just right sometimes means you got to take a little bit more time. Shot. So, yeah, we're definitely being deflected by a bone spur. Not much I can do about that. We have another question. Sure. One of our viewers wonders, what exactly does it mean that the disc has collapsed? And what do you do if it is bone on bone? So, great question. Somebody's saying, what do we do if it's bone on bone, the disc collapsed? You don't do anything. There's lots of people, millions of people with bone on bone discs. 
They have no pain at all, no symptoms. I used to believe that you had to treat that. Are you comfortable? Sir? Yes. All right. We're going to put you to sleep soon, okay? I, I just went right through. All right. Okay. So there's really no reason at all to. We're ready to go to sleep. There's no reason at all to put a spacer or do anything when you have bone on bone if patients have no symptoms. So there's far more people in the world with bone on bone and no symptoms than there are people with symptomatic disc disease and it's not from the bone on bone. It's actually from the annular tear. It's from the little tear in the back of the disc. That's where all the pain comes from. It has nothing to do with bone on bone. Okay, I need you to count from one to a hundred out loud. Sir, count out loud one to a hundred. What's that? Just lay still, don't move your back. You're doing good, keep counting. Luis, let me ask you a question. If the needle's not in the disc space, are we gonna do a discogram? So why are you handing me the die? Huh? I was not sure, sir. <coughs> oh, I'm sure. How come you can't see that? Are you awake? That was awfully quick. Shot. He's okay. Shot. So this is going to be a really tricky disc to do because the space is so collapsed. Shot. Shot. Don't move. You're doing fine. Shot. You're doing fine. I don't mind a little bit of reflexive movement, but I just don't want them coming off the table. Shot. So once again, this is L5S1. It is by far the hardest to do. Shot. And that's universally true. Unless there's something really weird about the other levels. Shot. So we're just taking our time. We're gonna go nice and slow. Shot. Shot. And I really want to make sure that I don't move the guide wire, so I'm holding it and supporting it. And we're basically at the back of the disc. I can feel the herniation. It's right just on, on underneath the nerve root. Shot. Let me know when he's, he seems to be pretty relaxed now. All right. Well, we have a question. Sure. 
Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, are you able to see patients from out of state? And if so, how long would you need to stay for the surgery? Yeah, that's a very good question. The answer is yes, we see out of state patients. We don't discriminate based on state or where you're from or location or anything for that matter. And I mean that tongue in cheek jokingly, of course, in the fondest of manners. I'm actually from out of state myself. I'm originally from California, but even before that, Germany, where I was born. But um, we do take any out of state, we take out of country. We have people from all over the world that come here for the surgery shot. As a matter of fact, I've asked our staff to put up a world map in the surgery center to show all the different places our patients come from. Um, usually it's three days. Uh, you show up, say on a Sunday night, you seen, did you go? You're seen on um, Monday. We do surgery Tuesday and we see you one more time Wednesday morning, you can fly home Wednesday. That's typical for our patients that come from out of state shot is three days. shot. I think that's as good as I'm going to get it with the guide wire. Shot. That was perfect. So we got lucky again. And they say it's better to be lucky than good. We um, were not able to put the needle in the disc space because it was there was so much bone spur in the back of the disc that it just blocked the needle from going in. But when the patient's asleep, they relax a little bit. It loosens their muscles up and allows the disc to spread open. So remember that disc space that had no gap, no space at all. Look at the, we got a six millimeter dilator in there now, opening it up. And um, that's a technique that I developed as a, uh, a salvage technique because it's not the primary technique. It's not what you want to do. You really want to get the needle in and have the guide wire inside the disc itself. So what you saw was, uh, I don't know, there was the old television show, Magu what was his name, McGuire? Magu huh? MacGyver, MacGyver, where he had to solve problems on the fly. And of course, I've used this solving this problem on the f on the fly before, and you know learned how to do it. But um, for the purists out there that are not able to on the fly modify what they do, and they're dogmatic, they won't be able to do the surgery. So it really takes confidence, creativity, but there's there's a lot that goes into it. But you're going to encounter situations where it's not easy, you know, and you have to do something different, shot. You have to adapt and change. And if you don't do that, you're not going to get the surgery done successfully. And sometimes I have to abort. I've had to abort, shot. I've had to abort a couple of surgeries, you know, in, in my career, probably three now, that I couldn't do because of the anatomy, the patient's anatomy. Not because of anything to do with me, but because of the patient's anatomy, you know? And you can't tell that ahead of time. It's impossible. I mean, sure, you can say you're more likely because you have a lot of arthritis in your facet joints or you have bone spurs around your discs, but you can't know for sure if a patient's gonna be able to get the surgery done. Like, I can tell you right now, every endoscopic spine surgeon I know would not try this surgery on this patient because of the scoliosis, the hypertrophy facet, the foramenal narrowing, the collapsed disc space, the osteophytes, they would not even try it. But I feel that as long as you have developed countermeasures to those occurrences, then you can navigate successfully into the disc space and get the surgery done. And I've been able to do that over and over again. So I don't take people's opportunity away to get better lightly 
I don't, in other words, I won't give up on the goal unless I would be putting the patient safety at risk, which I'm not putting the patient safety at risk with these strategies. So I'm just talking philosophically as a surgeon, what every surgeon kind of goes through. Now, for those of you who watch these surgeries a lot, you're going to see we don't have the blue dye. So the blue dye is very helpful. It stains degenerated disc. Can I still do the surgery without the blue dye? Absolutely. I've learned what degenerated disc looks like without the blue dye. I've learned the anatomy without the stain that I use normally. So it's kind of like asking a jet pilot if they can fly a jet and land a jet without actually seeing the runway. They can, it's a little harder, but they know how to use the instruments to fly a jet and navigate a jet, land a jet. So they use the instruments to fly. And uh, I've had to develop the same type of strategies. But look at the pinkness here. That pinkness is, is uh, granulation tissue. And I'm using the laser now to zap it away. So first of all, I apologize that <coughs> we couldn't do uh, everything exactly the way we like to normally do it. But the reason why we do these broadcasts is to teach the public about these surgeries and spine care and everything. And what you're going to find, why am I getting bubbles? What you're going to find is that, where's that sucking? Is that the bag being sucked? Is that uh, okay. As much as we surgeons like everything to be the same every single time, we, we never have that. So we have to, we have to adapt, okay? And sometimes you have to adapt more than other times. Adapt to, to the difference in the anatomy or the cir circumstances. So surgeons have, for example, if your patient, you know, took some blood thinners, maybe they're bleeding a little more. So you gotta adapt. You gotta lower the blood pressure more. You gotta monitor you're bleeding and make sure that it's not getting to be too much that it, you're going to have to transfuse the patient. The patient's going to be at risk of symptomatic anemia, which is not enough blood. I mean, there's a lot of countermeasures that the surgeon has to develop. And these are for every surgeon that does surgery. Stand by. The, the front has uh, got air bubbles. Wipe it. Yeah, for some reason, look at our lens. Our lens... I think that's a little better. It's just full of air bubbles. It was making it hard to see. That's better. So just like that, just like I, I came up with a counter strategy. Why was there so much air bubbles? Any reason? And then in life, you should always ask why. You know, whenever you see something out of the ordinary, ask why is it out of the ordinary? What's happening? What's different? So this is a piece of herniation right here. It's not much, but believe it or not, this is part of the reason why he's having his back pain. And I'm going to take that out uh, along with a few other pieces. You can see inside the disc, you can see the end plate of S1 there. It's pinkish. The end plate of L5 is over there. There's some scar tissue in here. And that's what we're dealing with right here, this white stuff to the left. It's all herniated disc and scar tissue. How are we doing, gentlemen? Do you need me to stop? just zapping away this tissue here this is part of the annular tear that we talk about all the time and the reason it's so scarred up is chronic inflammation and it's that chronic inflammation that causes the back pain just so you know so we want to get rid of this stuff and that's right there the most important part to get rid of
some reason the laser is making a lot of bubbles today. Is there a reason for that? It's a cavitation effect. Um, what power mode are you on? Two and fifteen. So that's the same. Now it's gone. It's very odd. There it's back again. It's not the irrigation. You can see the irrigation doesn't have bubbles. Why don't you talk to them and tell them we had a lot of bubbles today and it was intermittent and it was only when the laser was powered on, okay? Now let's see, maybe there's a setting we need to adjust. Anyway, there's part of the herniation right there. Standby laser. I'm going to use some pituitary rongeurs. These are endoscopic pituitary rongeurs. They're about a foot and a half long. And we're going to try to grab that herniation out. So there's not much herniation here, folks. Not much at all because the disc is collapsed. Remember, 95% of the disc is gone. But there's still a little bit of herniation. <laughs> I mean, it's like all the normal disc is gone. There's bubbles again. Why am I seeing, bu oh, this may be related to the vacuum space phenomena. This may be related to the, the gas inside the disc. But right here is the painful part. This is the annular tear that's all scarred up. This is what we're here for, this little nubbins of tissue. By removing these, th and I am the first surgeon in the world to ever describe this, this annular debridement. And it's part of the Duke laser disc repair. That's the surgery we're doing here at Duke Spine Institute. It's not done anywhere else in the world. But it's this debridement of the annulus that makes this surgery so unique and different than all other spine surgeries. Because transforaminal surgery has been done since the 70s, all right? Sure, my transforaminal surgery has the best record. We've never had a nerve damage. We've never had a CSF leak. We've got the best clinical outcome data and results for the Duke laser disc repair for transforaminal surgery. But what makes the surgery so special is what I'm doing right now that nobody else in the world does, unless they're copying me. But we described this in 2012. It's called an annular debridement. It's one of the three parts of the surgery that I described in our original paper we published, Duke Laser Disc Repair. And we published it in the National Library of Medicine in the United States of America. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people in the future that copy this and try to do what we do. What I would advise you, though, is that you should be, uh, if you're going to have the surgery done, have it done where, where people learn how to do it properly by training with me. And right now, there's nobody that's trained with me. So right now, there's nobody else in the world that does it besides Duke Spine Institute. I'm talking about September. What is today, 23rd? 24th, 2019. So if you want this surgery done properly, you come to Florida and you come to Melbourne, Florida, the Space Coast where we launch rockets into space in the United States. You come here to the Space Coast on the Atlantic Ocean. We're an hour from Orlando, so you can stop in Orlando and go visit Mickey Mouse or Universal Studios. Orlando has 65 million visitors a year. It's the number one tourist destination in the world. So we're literally 45 minutes from the airport and we can help you arrange transportation, lodging, a personal visit from Mickey Mouse with a signed autographed picture of you and Mickey. Luis, you still have your Mickey Mouse outfit, right? Yeah. Halloween is around the corner, folks. So what's everyone dressing up for Halloween as? Zach, what are you gonna wear? You gonna go as a Playboy Bunny again? I'm going to be on the road, so... You're going to be on the road? Yeah, heading home, so I'm not going to be dressing up. Awesome. All right. Have you ever dressed up for Halloween, Zach? Not for a couple of years, but I used to. All right. I still dress up for Halloween because I've got kids, and they go trick-or-treating, and I always try to be a good dad and try to scare people, scare my kids. But um, 
What's your favorite Halloween costume, Zach? You ever you ever had? What was your favorite? Uh, probably a Star Trek uniform. Star Trek, nice. And whose uniform did you wear? Captain Picard's. Captain Picard, you 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 seem like more of a Spock kind of guy, to me. Very intellectual. I guess Captain Picard is intellectual. But, you know, I don't really consider the next generation or new generation, whatever they are, I don't consider them Star Trek. You know that. And I'm going to upset some people here, but I grew up with Captain Kirk, James T. Kirk, you know, and Spock, and the original cast, Lieutenant Uhura, Bones, and to me, that's the real Star Trek. I'm sorry, but... I find, yes, Captain Kirk had some, we had some modern day issues with him because he wasn't very politically correct, but that all, that all being aside, I think that those Star Treks, in my opinion, were really the best. They really set the stage. All right, we're pretty much done at L5S1. You can see some fat up there at 12 o'clock. And we're really at the back of the annulus right now. I could go a little bit more, but I basically we're, we're done. I mean, this is the back of the disc. And just the further out I go, the more that fat's going to come out. We don't really want a bunch of fat coming in here into the endoscope because it's really not why we're here. We're not here to take fat out. We're here to take the granulation tissue that's within the annular tear. We're here to take that out. We're here to take the herniation out. And we've done that. So uh, I feel pretty good about this level. I don't see a lot of lateral disc. I'll just check here, though, just to make sure we don't leave anything behind that would hit a nerve and cause his leg pain. Our patient primarily has left leg pain. That's the really the main reason he's here. And let's take a look. And believe it or not, there's still some fat around the nerve. That's amazing. So even with that disc space completely collapsed, he still has some fat around the nerve. All right, standby laser. We're done with L5S1. Now, if we can get as lucky at 045, I'd be happy. So we're going to suck the water out. You'll see it drain down. And scope off. Huh? What's wrong? Yeah, thank you, Luis. Good job. I like that command and conquer mentality you've got. That's what I want to see, you know? Leave nothing to chance. You understand? Take full control of the situation. So anyway, yeah, for out-of-staters, we definitely take you. We have a three-day process. I mean, technically, if you really wanted to do it, you could do it in one day. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, to be honest with you. After doing over a 1,000 of these surgeries, I feel very confident that you could come in, have your visit, have your surgery, be discharged from the surgery center, just for, everyone, for everyone's edification, these surgeries are all done outpatient. Uh, I think I've mentioned that before, but every one of our patients goes home usually an hour after surgery. Now, they can't drive themselves because you're not allowed to drive a car um, if you've had surgery, you know, if you've had propofol sedation, which our patients all have sedation. All right, let me know when you're ready for an x-ray. That's good. We have another question. All right, I'll take it in a moment. So um, people that have this surgery can come in and get it done, and they can literally leave that same day, about an hour after their surgery is over, but they need someone to drive them. And as long as you come with another adult that can drive you and look after you, there's nothing wrong with um, basically leaving that, that night to go home on a plane or driving home. There's nothing that keeps you from flying. So for people that are really pressed for time for whatever reason, they could come in and get fixed on the same day. 
but obviously that takes a lot of prearrangement. So we'd have to have your lab work, your EKG, chest X-ray all done, you know, and you'd send those results in. You'd have to get medical clearance usually done uh, at home where you live by your primary care doctor or cardiologist. So if we have your medical clearance, we've, you've stopped taking medication you're not supposed to take before surgery, like blood thinners, anti-inflammatories, et cetera. If you've done all that, and are we doing okay, guys? If you've done all that, and you wanna have surgery just that same day and go home that same day, we can do it. You just talk to my staff and we'll make that happen. Shot? All right, so again, we have to hope that we're able to do this because we're not in the disk space completely. We're just barely in, shot. And we're really hoping that I can use this guide wire to get to where we need to be with the dilator. And then we're going to use the dilator basically to access the disk space, shot. So I'm just very carefully removing the needle. And then I'm going to keep the guide wire right where it is so it doesn't move. So I can still use it to get down to the, to the back of the disc where I need to be. I want to make sure it hasn't moved, shot. Now you can see the bone spur back there. Right where the wire comes to the back of the disc, there's like a little lip, like a bird's beak hooking down. You all see that? Off the end plate there. That's the end plate of L4, inferior end plate of L4. And it's just... Really, uh, that's what was deflecting me so I couldn't get into the disk space before. But I think the dilator is actually going to be able to, to be a little bit more assertive. All right. Did you have another question? Shot? Yes. We have a viewer asking, can you do anything for non-Chiari syringomyelia? Can I do anything for non-Chiari syringomyelia? So, great question, Shot. Um, what they're talking about is a fluid collection within the spinal cord, Shot. And sometimes, if you have a fluid collection in your spinal cord, sometimes it's due to Chiari malformation, which is a, where part of the brain uh, and brain stem sag down into the foramen magnum or through the foramen magnum, Shot. And other causes of, of syringomyelia include tumors of the spinal cord and trauma to the spine, where you have a, something compressing the cord. It causes a syringomyelia. It has something to do with the flow of CSF shot. But if you're talking about a pure syringomyelia that has nothing to do with tumor, has nothing to do with trauma, has nothing to do with Chiari, it's very rare that those would ever need surgery. So I'm not sure why you think it needs to be treated. Um, the only reason, there is another reason, by the way, I forgot to mention, tethered cord. If you have a spinal cord that's tethered, and what that means is there's a, uh, the bottom of the spinal cord is in the lumbar spine at the bottom of the thoracic region. And if, you're, if you have a lipoma or a tumor, that's attaching your spinal cord to the surrounding spine. That can cause a syringomyelia. And then if you have a thickened phylum terminale, which is the final piece of tissue coming off the spinal cord, that can also cause a tethering of your cord. So whoever's asking the syringomyelia question needs to be have a thorough evaluation by a neurosurgeon. But um, I would like to know why you have syringomyelia. Shot. There's got to be a reason, okay? And it's not just, it's usually not just, hey, I have syringomyelia. You have something causing it. So I would need to know why you have syringomyelia. Wow, that's a big herniation there. Shot. You can see I'm just right up against that thing. All right, I'm going to try to advance this then. The mallet, since I've done all I can with my hand shot. All right, so our guide wire is still in place, which is good. Shot.
shot. I like our lineup. Can aim south a little bit more. Shot. Shot. Hmm. Shot. Luis, give me something to hit this with. Uh, I don't really see what we could use. Shot. Almost there. You wanna maybe hit the culture? No. Shot. That's better. All right. Take that. Shot. That's better. Take it. Shot. Well, I could definitely feel that go in. Yep. We made it. Again, another save. Shot. Because otherwise we'd have to abort this level if we couldn't get in safely. And by having the patient relaxed as opposed to the awake state, I'm able to do that. Did I answer the last question effectively? I think I did. Basically, I need to know why you have shot, why you have uh, syringomyelia. But can I fix it with a laser? No. That answer won't change. I cannot fix syringomyelia with the laser. Can I fix it endoscopically? I wouldn't even try. It's too risky. I'm not, not the right technique. Is that my shot? Yes, not the right technique for you. Syringomyelia, if you have to have it fixed, is fixed with a shunt usually, but it depends on what causes it. That's why you need to know what's causing it. Because if your syringomyelia is due to a tethered cord, you need to have an untethering surgery. You need to have an operation on the bottom of your spine to basically detach the spinal cord shot from the surrounding spine. Shot. It's advancing the dilator and the tube at the same time. That's better. Shot. Is that it? Yes, now we're good. Come on now. Shot. Shot. All right. I need that back. If I can just grab this guy. Nope. I need a little bit more. I may not be able to get it with this. I may need something else. Yeah. Let's try the coker. That won't work. Shot. Is that me right there? All right. So we don't want to advance the dilator with the tube. It's bad. Shot. And that's what's happening, probably because there's a little bit of tissue trapped in there that's causing them to move as one. Yeah. So we're going to need to have our, oh, Good. it's coming. Thank God, huh? Yeah. Good. Well, God is smiling on me today. Shot? Shot. That's it? Yes. All right. We've been able to separate the tube from the dilator. How's the patient doing? Good. Blood pressure is good. All right. That should be good enough right there. 
So you can see every single level, every patient has different challenges, but we're prepared. A good surgeon is always prepared. That's it, it's fluoro out. So last time we broadcasted a video, we got in trouble with uh, Facebook right i think zach is there because sony complained that we had music in the background they could hear and we were infringing on copyright which is complete horseshit because number one we don't sell these videos where this is public and it's for educational purpose and so what if you have some music in the background you're allowed to that that should uh, not be the case where we're we're getting penalized on the broadcast so they want to mute part of our video and i think sony either Sony or um, one of the other record label companies um, basically took over our video. So I don't even know if it's available. Zach, is it still available? It's available, just part of it's muted. Well, that's one of them, but the other company that was, that was asserting ownership of one of the songs that were playing in the background, they took ownership of our video, which is really upsetting to me. I don't know if they're still allowing it to be present on YouTube or if they've basically taken it off of YouTube or Facebook or wherever it was that we had an issue, but. I think they changed the policy, so now Facebook just mutes it instead of doing the ownership All right. claim. Fair enough, but I disputed both of them because um, we're not using the music to make profit. It's not like we're making a song or a concert or something we're not producing a, an album with those artists work i mean that's just background when we play music during surgery for us to listen to and most importantly these are public free you know educational videos for everyone to watch there's there's no charge so they should not be um can you wipe that please they should not be bothering us basically but they are. Uh, who's over there besides Zach? Sean? Yes, sir. All right. Would somebody tell Sandy to make some fresh coffee, please? We're going to be done soon, and I need a fresh pot of coffee. So this is all scar tissue from chronic inflammation. I think in medicine in the year 2019, probably for a few couple, couple of few years now, that's a Southern term, by the way, a Southern expression, a couple of few years. That's something I learned ever since I moved to Florida. I didn't learn that in California. But um, for, the, for a little while now, we are learning that a lot of diseases in the human body, a lot of bad conditions are due to inflammation. And uh, for example, nobody really knew why people had back pain, and we still get questions about bone on bone, but it's really inflammation that causes the pain. And the inflammation that causes back pain is not inflammation from bone on bone, it's actually inflammation from the annular tear in the back of the disc. Stand by laser. Right where, we, right where the Duke laser disc repair fixes posterior lateral disc tear and herniation. Uh, can't get it. You can see the end plates. Pretty raggedy. Again, this is L45. We've already done L5S1, the bottom disc. We've got one more to go. Our patient is blissfully asleep, enjoying a nice slumber. And we use propofol sedation. Propofol is really the best. You're going to find out why there's so much bubbles, okay? Yes, sir. I don't know if it's the vacuum disc phenomena or if it's a setting on the, on the laser. Mike, will you look into that with Luis? I know the temperature of the water was different today. I don't, I don't think it has to do with the temperature. See, the laser creates a, a sonic wave basically a pulse wave a pressure wave that um, calls what's called cavitation 
in the water. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. What, what do you mean different temperature? Like colder? Yeah, I mean, not today. It was uh, warmer, actually. Warmer. I just, it still feels cold to my fingers. And I really, really doubt that's the issue. It's all scar tissue from the herniation and chronic inflammation. Now there's a little nub in a herniation standby. There's the part we came for. Hanging out, looking at us at 12 o'clock. There's a piece of herniation right there that I shoved into the disc space from the uh, foramen. Take. Had some good questions this morning. Once again, I'm Dr. Aro Duke Majan, CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. We're performing endoscopic surgery, transforaminal lumbar, on a patient with three bad discs in his lower back, standby laser. And he's having a mostly left leg pain. We talked about having traditional fusion surgery versus laser. I felt the laser surgery was a much better option. So did the patient. But the alternative for this patient would be to do a lumbar decompression and instrumented fusion with reconstruction. So you need to fix the scoliosis while you're in there because you're fusing the patient's spine and you don't want to fuse somebody in scoliosis or kyphosis. So we would have to fix sagittal and coronal deformities using inner body cages and osteotomies. And we'd have to do wide decompressions. So we'd have to take the facet joints out to get the nerves unpinched in the neural foramen. Whereas right here, we can go right through the neural foramen and unpinch the nerve in the foramen endoscopically without fusing the patient. So a much better surgery. And there's the source of any back pain it's the, uh, that is the inflammation within the annular tear. You can see how pink it is. And we call this a debridement of the annular tear or annular debridement for short. And this is the hallmark technique of the Duke laser disc repair that separates from, from all of the surgeries is the annular debridement. A lot of other spine surgeries involve discectomy alone. They don't do an annular breedment. They just do discectomy or laminectomy or foramenotomy or fusion, sometimes osteotomy, but they don't do an annular debridement. So this is the only surgery in the world that does an annular debridement, unless somebody's trying to copy me, which is fine. I expect they will. Uh, I'm hoping that people do. Uh, but like I said, you need the right training. You can't just start doing this. You need to be trained properly how to do it. And that means my direct supervision with you here in the operating room, making sure that you put the needles in properly, you position the patient properly, and, and also something that a lot of people don't think about out there. They don't think about complications. I mean, let's face it. If you go out and buy a new car and you have a problem with your car, you want to know that w the people you bought it from are going to be able to fix the problem uh, and not just blow you off. So I had a call the other day from the emergency room because I take call at the hospitals to help people that need emergency care. And the ER doctor called me and said, I got a patient here with a pump, a, a pain pump that was put in by a pain management doctor and, and his pain management doctor can't help him. I said, what do you mean he can't help him? He goes, well, he, he said that he doesn't, doesn't have privileges and he doesn't know what to do, but there's a problem with the pump. Uh, I said, well, he's going to need to talk to his pain management doctor. We need to make sure that he's on narcotic orally so that if his pump malfunctions, he doesn't go through withdrawals. Because people who have a pain pump that stops working, they can have life-threatening uh, narcotic withdrawals. So he was on not just a pain pump, but his pain pump had morphine and dilaudid both which, you know, it's bad enough to be on a pain pump with one of those. I guess their pain management doctor decided to put both, which is extremely irresponsible. And then, of course, when things go bad, the 
the doctors disappear and they're not there to help their patients. So I think it's really important that physicians be responsible, not just with doing a treatment or procedure, because procedures pay money, that's where they make their money. And they wanna do the procedure, but they don't wanna take care of any problems that arise as a result of it. So you have to be very careful who you select to do your care. You don't want someone who's not gonna be available to help you, okay? I'm always available for my patients. I give any patient that wants my cell phone number, my cell phone number, so they can call me if they need me. And uh, I believe in taking care of people after their treatment. Of course, if, um, if they go somewhere else, that's their choice, you know. But for the most part, our patients come back to us if they need help, and we always take care of them. We have another question. Yep. We have a viewer who is asking, how are your coral reef studies going? And have you had any uh -huh. luck on dispersing it? How are my coral reef studies going? I'm ready to pull what hair I have left out of my head. You know, I guess you could say curing back pain is easier than curing uh, coral disease. Though I may have had another breakthrough, but it's extremely slow and painful. It's extremely slow and painful. Not because I don't put the time in. I'm literally up every night till two or three in the morning doing research on the corals that are dying. But what I've discovered for those of you who don't know is that corals are dying because of an infection from a protozoan parasite. And they're called marine ciliated protozoans. And really I'm the first person to discover this. And I did experiments to prove it. And these are coaches postulate experiments. There are four, a set of four experiments where I followed coaches postulates to prove a microorganism causes disease. Long story short, that was over a year ago and that's not a big deal anymore for me. But still 99% of the people out there don't get it and they don't believe it. They still think it's warm water temperature or changes in alkalinity or oxygen tension or carbon dioxide, but it's not. Those may be making the coral more susceptible to death from the protozoan parasite, but these protozoan parasites are the cause of coral death. I say that today and I've said it for a year and of course it'll be 20 years before the rest of the world catches up to my discovery, which is fine. But it's not stopping me from doing my research on how to cure the disease. And curing the disease, honestly, is a lot harder than discovering it, the cause of it. So I have tried so many different treatments and I think I'm making some progress. Um, I don't think it's as straightforward as I thought it would be. It's not just, oh, you've got an infection with a, a parasite, go kill the parasite and you'll save the coral. You actually can't kill the coral during the treatment. And what I think I'm dealing with is a toxicity from the treatment, either directly on the coral tissue cells or as a result of the parasites dying. And I can't tell yet which one it is. But I have now discovered 11, 11 factors that will kill the parasite. Unfortunately, every time I treat the coral, the coral dies as well. So right now I'm banging my head against the wall trying to figure out how to not kill the coral tissue but kill the parasite. Yeah, and let me just say that my, my coral lab has looks like a real lab in a university with chemicals and beakers and petri dishes, microscope, everything. So that's my second life. So taking care of um, human patients and taking care of coral patients. That's probably a 50-50 for my time. As far as racing goes for Arius, he's in 10th grade in high school. We haven't had any races lately except for some local races which are nothing to write home about. Uh, he's doing well. We're waiting for funding for his career, basically, from um, his agent, Susie. And uh, he has another agent, Bruce, that's helping out. But he's officially signed with um, Independent Sports and Entertainment, ISE, now for about two months. And they're working on getting him a basically a lifetime sponsor. So... 
he's uh, hopefully going to be the next American driver that makes it to Formula One. And not just makes it to Formula One, but actually wins in Formula One, given the right opportunity. There's the nerve right there, just north of us, just so you all can see it. A lot less fat on this one, more scar tissue. This guy looks inflamed, but you can see how close the herniated disc was to the nerve. So we've gotten rid of the herniated disc with the laser and the nerve is now completely decompressed. So we're done with this level. We have one more level to go. I don't see any more herniation to take out. Maybe this little touch right here or titch, I should say. Laser off. Lights on, please. Thank you for asking about the coral research. Um, honestly, it's very hard. I'm the only one doing it in the world right now on the protozoan parasites that I know of. Nobody else uh, unless there's somebody who's read my work and they're taking it serious, but the problem is funding, really getting money to do the research. For not just not just for me, you know, I ha I use my own personal funds to do all my coral research, uh, but I'm talking about for marine biologists, marine biologists that work at universities, the real full-time marine biologists, they need money, they need funding, they need grants, and there's no. Nobody doing this stuff anymore. Nobody's really looking at why the corals are dying. They all think they've figured it out that it's global warming. So basically, the funding sources have dried up because they're saying, well, it's global warming, right? But no, it's not global warming, it's a parasite. So I don't have a lot of free time, unfortunately. But if I had more free time, if I had more help, I would be writing for grants from uh, NOAA, and a few other, um, like Scripps, Institute of Oceanography. Um, I would probably write for funding and support from a few other United States-based and perhaps international agencies that care about the ocean and the reefs. Um, but I honestly don't have time to do that. So I could use some help. I need research assistance. I have tons of experiments I want to do, but I don't have time to do them myself because I. I don't get started on experiments till I get home in the evening. Probably back there, back there. But for those of you who know me, you know that I, I don't sit around and wait for someone else to do the work. I'll do it myself if no one else is interested in getting it done. And I'm not really usually the kind of person to ask for help. Uh, if people see value in, ben in, in helping out, then they'll help out. If they don't, then they don't. But I'm still gonna, still gonna charge forward myself. If I have to do it all myself, I'll do it all myself. Shot. Of course, I'll recruit my kids in their free time to help out. I have one employee now, shot, and she's helping with the maintenance of the system. All right. So this is interesting. Shot. Is that it there? She's doing more of the maintenance work on the coral system right now, so I can focus more on the research shot. All right, good. You can see the guide wire there in the disc shot. By her doing the maintenance, it frees me up to do more of the research shot. So uh, for some reason, the guide wire is being trapped by the, the needle. So I have to really, and so a lot of friction here shot. I'm not sure why, maybe the needle's bent. Really almost impossible to get out, Sean. You have a question there? Sean? Uh, we do. Uh, we have a viewer who says... I can't uh, hear you. It's pretty low. We have a viewer who says, I have a herniated disc, L4, 5, and L5, S1. I'm having right leg pain, which is severe at night to the point of not being able to sleep, uh, what would you recommend doing to help? What would I recommend doing? I recommend if you have a herniated disc and you have bad sciatic pain at night, you need surgery. I mean, I, I'm not gonna tell you to rub canola oil on your back because that's not gonna work. I'm not, this is not a place where you go to say, oh, uh, you know, use a, a 10 inch pillow and put it between your legs. If you have, pain down your leg from a herniated disc and it's been going on for longer than um, six weeks, you need surgery. And the surgery I'd recommend is the one you're watching right now. Duke laser disc repair. It's the best there is in the world. 
Other surgeries are going to end up causing removal of bone from your spine, which is going to weaken your spine. You don't want to have a microdiscectomy because the surgeons always take the bone out in the back. And when they take that bone out, they're taking part of your joint out, part of your stabilizing joint. You already have a problem there, right? You have a herniated disc, so you don't want to make that worse. How's our blood pressure? Seems like it's going up a little. Yeah, good. Shot, all right, good. So you, you, don't want to, uh, you don't want to take bone out from the back of your spine from a microdiscectomy. Put some pressure here, please. Okay. You want to go through the foramen like I'm doing. Shot. So I think the tip of the needle must be bent. Jesus. Shot. You see that release? I don't know if it's a, what it was. Okay. Long story short, my opinion, the Duke laser disc repair that I'm doing right now would be your best option for surgery. Shot. So some people who don't know me very well think, oh, well, you say that, Shot, because you do the Duke laser disc repair. Let's, we need to wag this because I can see the asymmetry to the back of the vertebral body. But the fact of the matter is, you know, people get the wrong idea. They think that, oh, surgery at, with one surgeon is going to be the same no matter where you go. It's all the same. It's not. It's very different. I apologize. Not wag. Let's go back. I want you to rotate. Either my side's, my side's down too much or my side's up too much, but figure it out. This is the scoliosis part. Shot. Now go north. Shot. That's better. Let's try and do a little bit more. Yep, shot. Let's see what that does. Yeah, I think that's better. That's better. Let's keep it there. So the fact of the matter is I can do any surgery that's done anywhere in the world by any other surge, spine surgeon, okay? That's the training I have. That's the experience I have. I can do anything they can do. But the re reality is that I don't do all the other surgeries for a reason because they're not as good as the one you're watching right now, the Duke laser disc repair. I've done hundreds of microdiscectomies, hundreds of thousands of laminectomies actually. I've done fusions, I've done artificial discs, I've done fusion from the front, from the side, from the back. I've done every spine surgery there is. And I've seen how patients do with those surgeries. I've seen the complications, I've seen the success. I've seen the return to life, the pain, the suffering afterwards. I know about all the different surgeries. And I also read about my colleagues and what they're doing and how their outcomes are. And there's no surgery more successful, more safe, Le less invasive than the surgery you're watching right now for your problem of herniated disc with a pinched nerve. None. I tell you that with confidence. Shot. And these are all outpatient, as are many microdiscectomies done nowadays. But also, um, we've had zero complications to date. Shot. And that's not true for the other surgeries. That's not true for microdiscectomy, okay? There's no surgeon in the world that has zero complication with a microdiscectomy. They've all had spinal fluid leaks or infection or destabilization, is that it there? Yes, sir. Destabilization means they've weakened that segment by taking out too much bone, okay? And, uh, or, I wouldn't call recurrent herniation a complication because I don't think that's a complication. If you take the herniation out and the patient does something to make another one, that's not a complication of surgery. That's just the patient not doing what they're supposed to do to avoid re-injuring the disc. So, but complications happen with most every type of spine surgery, pretty much every type of spine surgery except this one. In 13 years of doing this surgery, I've had zero complications. So. From a safety standpoint, this is your best surgery in the world for a herniated disc. From a success, our patients, if you take every patient we have and we ask them, how much relief did you get in your back pain? How much relief did you get in your leg? 
or neck and arm if you're doing a cervical disc herniation? The answer on average is 95%. The range is 50% to 100%. The worst we've ever had was 50%. Uh huh. So when you have a spine surgery that the worst you could do is 50% better on your pain and the best is 100 and it averages 95% relief of back pain or neck pain, leg or arm pain and arm symptoms or leg symptoms like numbness, tingling or weakness from a pinched nerve or irritated nerve. If you have a surgery that has 95% success, there's no reason to do any other surgery because there's no other surgery in the world that has the same success rate. None. Not even close, to be honest with you. So with a safety profile of no complications in 13 years, over 1,000 procedures, and a success rate of eliminating symptoms of 95% across the board, and a one-hour recovery outpatient spine surgery with a Band-Aid incision, why would you do anything else? I mean, you may say, well, I live in England or I live in France or I live in South Africa. But, you know, is, you, is it really? I mean, to me, I've seen people die from spine surgery. I've seen people paralyzed. I've seen major complications, not my patients, but other surgeons. Why would you want to subject yourself to that? I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I'm just telling you the truth. Like, why would you, why would you want to do that? I mean, honestly, I think if most spine surgeons knew how to do this surgery, they'd have probably pretty equally good results rather than doing really open si spine surgery. I truly believe open spine surgery, like laminectomies, microdiscectomies, even fusions are all going to be basically obsolete in 20 years. And the only reason they're not obsolete today is because the spine surgeons don't know how to do the surgery. If I can magically instill the knowledge and experience in every spine surgeon in the world how to do this surgery, nobody would do anything but the surgery. Of course, I'd want to buy stock in the company that sells the equipment first. But I'm serious. No, no surgeon would ever do anything but the surgery if they knew how to do it. They just don't know how to do it. And they don't have the equipment to do it. Because this equipment cost me over a million dollars to buy personally. I personally bought it with my own money. Because when I saw the surgery done overseas in Korea and uh, by a German surgeon, when I saw it done, I said, my God, that's amazing. That's the future of spine surgery. I saw that 14 years ago. And I've been doing it ever since then, quietly for the most part, because I just don't like attention. But at this point, I think people need to know about it because I'm very confident in the results. And if it was me looking for some relief from my back pain, from a herniated disc or my neck pain, I would want to find the best. And it's so hard out to find the best out there to get the best care because you don't know what to believe. And there's a lot of liars and charlatans out there who will tell you, you know, not the truth and they know they're telling you not the truth but there's also surgeons who really think you know that they really do walk on water and they'll tell you that they're really the best at what they do and I don't want to be one of those but of course I'm kind of treading on thin ice right now for doing that but that's not my intention I'm not trying to tell you I'm the best surgeon I'm trying to tell you this is the best surgery that's what I'm trying to tell you so if you understand my message you understand what I'm saying is this is the best surgery but if there was someone else that did it, then you can go to them too, as long as they have as good of a result. And by the way, the results we have here at Duke Spine Institute, they're not just because of me. I have a whole team of people here. We have 80 employees. So I can't do 80 people's work myself. I couldn't do, I couldn't have the great results without my, my workers, without my team, okay? And um, the fact of the matter is, is that it requires everyone doing their job properly to have great results, including our anesthesiologist. So uh, it's an entire team approach and it's about having the right equipment, having the right people. What, why is that stuck? Having uh, the right experience, the right medications. Uh, it's a lot of things. We've got five minutes left and we'll be done. I'm letting my anesthesiologist know I've got five minutes. 
anesthesiologists like to know when the surgery is going to be done so they can start preparing the patient. And I like that when the anesthesia prepares the patient because that means it's safer for the patient, better for the patient, you get a faster recovery, which is always better for the patient. So. Oh, or yeah, of course. Yeah, you're going to do the RFA, but I'm, I'm going to be done in five minutes. Why do I feel like we have a question? It's just a gut feeling. No? No questions? We have one question. Oh, I knew it. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, is the success rate for this surgery, uh, for the cervical version of the surgery the same as the lumbar surgery, and is the neck area any more complicated or problematic? Oh, gosh, thank you for asking that question. So one of our viewers said, is the success rate for the neck or cervical spine, basically, is it the same as the lumbar? And the answer is yes, it is the same. It is exactly the same, which, you know, obviously is amazing. But if you think about it, and I've pondered on this for a long time, you're treating the same disease. You're basically treating a herniation with an annular tear and, a, and an irritated nerve, right? But um, there's something else about the cervical spine that's quite interesting, is that you have the dura that goes around the brain right up there next to the neck. So people with herniated discs that are symptomatic in the cervical spine a lot of times get headaches as well. They kind of shoot up the back of the neck into the, the occipital region and the back of their head. And those headaches are not migraines. Those headaches are coming from their spine. We call them cervicogenic headaches. And they're really due to inflammation in the back of the disc, right where the dura is, irritating the dura, causing inflammation of the dura. And that dura is the covering around the brain. Now, nobody ever taught me this. This I had to figure out because I had a lot of patients with headaches. Um, and when we checked on them after their surgery, it turns out their headaches went away. So I was shocked because I didn't expect that, right? I never expected that. I was never trained as a neurosurgeon and the best training program in the world, basically University of Florida in Gainesville, I was never told that headaches could come from a disc problem in the neck. We're always taught about migraines, cluster headaches, tension headaches, you know, meningitis from inflammation, infection from, you know, viruses or bacteria. But we are never learned about a cervicogenic headache because I think most people don't know about it. They don't either know about it or they don't they're not aware of it for whatever reason. But the fact of the matter is our patients that had the Duke laser disc repair in the neck would get rid of their headache by 95%. So it was quite remarkable. And two thirds of our patients that we did laser surgery on for herniated discs in their neck had headaches, cervicogenic headaches. And of those two thirds of people, 95% was the average relief. So to answer your question, the results are the same for the neck and for the lower back for herniated discs. And the, um, the s as far as which surgery has, um, which, which surgery has a big higher complication rate, they both have the same, zero. I've had zero complications in the neck and zero in the back. As far as which surgery is more difficult approach, you know, to perform, definitely the cervical, for sure. The cervical disc um, surgery is riskier. It's, um, it, it's, higher, you know, potentially a higher complication rate, though zero is not higher than zero in my hands. Um, but definitely cervical is much riskier, much harder to do technically than lumbar. Lumbar is easy. I mean, except for somebody like this patient where you have completely collapsed discs, you have huge facet joints, you have rotated spine. I mean, the alignment is bad, the, the facet joint disease is bad, and you gotta go past the facet joint to get into the disc. So we got lucky again today. You know, I've had to abort probably one in a hundred cases I'll have to abort uh, because I can't get in and do that disc. Or, you know, usually if they have three discs, I have to abort one, then I abort one. But there's, I hate to say this, but there's an abortion of the surgery technique on at least one disc out of a hundred is what I would say my average is. So I don't consider that a complication. It's not a complication. It, it's it's not really an abortion for the technical term that we all think of it, but you're aborting the, that part of the surgery. That's what we say in surgery, you abort it. So um, definitely cervical is a lot worse. 
a lot, a lot, a lot more difficult for me, and I think for anybody. So there's just so much more at risk. If you, if you're a millimeter off in the cervical, you could hit the carotid artery, and you're going to cause a stroke, and the patient can definitely die easily. And if you go to the jugular vein, you can cause a stroke. And if you go through the esophagus, you're not gonna, the patient won't be able to swallow or eat food anymore. They'll need a permanent feeding tube, most likely. So there's a lot of risk, for sure. But um, I've been very blessed in that we've not had any complication. I don't think I've just been lucky. I think, honestly, there's a herniation, by the way. I think that it's from good technique and knowing the anatomy really well and knowing what to do and what not to do. So I make the surgeries look easy if you watch me do them. It's not because I want to make them look easy. It's, it's just that I have so much experience in my hands and uh, I feel very comfortable doing the surgery. I know exactly what I'm doing. But if you gave that equipment to a novice, somebody who's done oh, maybe 100 or less, it'd be a very different experience. There'd be a lot more cussing there may be, you know, a lot more ambulances called and, you know, paramedics and EMS and all that come and come pick this patient up. They need, a, they need to be transferred to the hospital. So um, the fact of the matter, though, is it matters who does your surgery. It matters where the surgery is done. So location and team, surgeon are all very important in surgery, any kind of surgery, not just spine surgery. We have a spine facility in our town that's located south of us. I won't mention any names, but they routinely kill patients from spine surgery. And um, there's not much that I can do about it. I can't stop people from going there. And uh, I know they've been investigated by Medicare and s somehow they've managed to still stay in business and they've had Numerous spine surgeons come through, all of which I would never hire at Duke Spine Institute, though they've asked to be hired here. I've refused them because their quality is not good, their caliber of care is not good, their ethics and morals are not good. I won't mention names, but those doctors are all gone. They come and go because they have too many complications in one year. They literally have probably 10 complications in one year where they're at over there. And there's lots of lawsuits, malpractice suits, and investigations, and all kinds of stuff going on. What I'm trying to say is, is that where you get your care matters, okay? And it's not like you're buying a car. You're not buying a Toyota Corolla. When we're, you just shop around for the cheapest deal. You want to go where the quality is the best for your spine. Otherwise, you're going to end up being worse off, potentially, than you are going in. And nobody wants to be worse off with spine surgery. That's my, uh, what I would say to you, okay? There's probably very good spine surgeons around the world, but who, where are they? I have no idea. I honestly, there's only one surgeon I would even trust to do my spine surgery, one. Out of all the surgeons I know, because Dr. Roten is dead, and he's the person I would trust the most. He was the chairman of the Department of University of Florida, Department of Neurosurgery in Gainesville. World famous neurosurgeon, one of the best in the world ever. All right, he's like, uh, for those of you who know basketball, he's like the Magic Johnson of neurosurgery. <coughs> okay? And Dr. Roden, I would trust to do my surgery. But he's, he's passed away. He would be in his 80s today. Okay? And there's really only one other person that I would trust. That's my brother. He's a neurosurgeon. But even then, I don't entirely trust him. I hate to say this, but it's the truth. Uh, he's a good surgeon, but he's 10 years younger than me. He has 10 years less experience. But he doesn't know how to do the Duke laser disc repair. He just does fusions, laminectomies, traditional surgery. Okay? So um, he won't use very state-of-the-art equipment. For example, he won't use the microscope that I, that I require surgeons to use if they're going to operate on my patients. You have to use a special microscope so you can see everything. So every surgeon is different. Surgeons are stubborn people, and they want it their way. I'm, I'm no different, by the way. I'm the same. 
I'm very stubborn. And surgeons want to do things the way they're comfortable doing it, the way they've been taught to do it. <coughs> On the other hand, I, I was never taught to do this in residency. I actually had to go learn it when I was done with my training, which is another thing. It's really hard to teach surgeons anything new, <laughs> bone spur, but that's not anywhere near the nerve, so I'm leaving it alone. Standby laser. I actually had to go and learn this technique overseas. For those of you who've been watching my broadcast for a while, you know that. You know that I did. Laser. You know I went overseas to learn this. So I had to take time away from my practice, time away from my family to go learn this technique, the basics of it. Not the Duke Laser Disc Repair technique, because that's my technique, but to learn how to place the needle, to learn how to <coughs> get into the foramen. All of that is what I had to learn on my own, you know, through training from surgeons. But I did it after traditional residency was done, fellowship was done. <coughs> and a lot of surgeons don't want to take the time to do that. They, they really don't have the time or interest in going and learning something new like that. I mean, we have, we have fellows here at Duke Spine Institute. Our anesthesiologist is a fellow. Dr. Santiago is graduating in a few weeks. He's a fellow. He learned. These doctors took time out of their busy schedule, their families, their practices, to come here to learn for a year how to do interventional pain management from Dr. Patel, probably the best interventionalist in the world. And um, that shows tremendous amount of dedication and commitment in my opinion, I don't think they do it for the money because they're not making much money here. They're getting an education. But they do it, I believe, because they want to go out and, and do a better job for patients than patients are currently getting. So I like that. I like doctors that want to improve themselves so they can do a better job for their patients. That's what I did. And that's how I learned this Duke Laser Disc Repair basic technique. I have a Raytech off the field. So... Um, unfortunately, I don't see a lot of doctors doing that. It matters where you go. That's all I'm going to say. It matters who you go to to do the surgery. It matters where they do the surgery. I can't do the surgery in the hospital because the hospital doesn't have the equipment. I went to the hospital 14 years ago, and I asked them to buy all the equipment to do the laser surgery, and they refused. They said they didn't have the money. They didn't have the budget. They would consider it for next year. Next year came, and they still didn't have the money. So it was just excuse after excuse. Well, I wasn't going to let their lack of vision and foresight affect my career and what I could do for my patients. So I bought, bought the equipment myself. I took a loan out. I took a huge risk. And I bought it. Spent a million and a half dollars. I've spent more since then. Um, but I did all that so that I could give patients this really amazing surgery. I'm going to call our EBL 5 cc's. Let's keep the blood pressure under control in the recovery, please. And, uh, you know, somewhere probably like below 110, 105, 100, right? Yeah. And uh, you're applying pressure for a few minutes. Sure. And we'll put our bandage on. Um, Zach, you want to you wanna see the incision? Luis, why don't you show them the 7 millimeter incision that we did all three discs with? We can see it. Okay. So this is a DLDR left L3445 5S1. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come to the to the conference room and hang out with my team and answer some more questions and just talk. All right. So grab some popcorn, grab a, a Coke, and uh, I'll see you soon. And we're doing a left our left RFA L3 to S1 RFA, right? Thank you, everybody. Great job today.
Okay, Dr. R. Duke Majin here with you again. I left the operating room and now I'm hanging here with uh, Zach. And I'm going to take some questions and answer them for you. We just completed a duke laser disc repair left side lumbar, which is the lower back, L34, L45, and L5S1 for basically degenerated discs in this patient at L34, L45, L5S1. And I think what confuses a lot of our viewers is they, if they've been paying attention, they see that this patient has totally collapsed this. They're basically, this is an older gentleman um, and he's got bad arthritis of the spine. And he has a lot of the things that we see in spines as people get bad arthritis and they get older. Uh, and, and I don't mean that as, as you get older, you get bad arthritis. What I mean is, as you age, um, if you have an injury to your spine, to your disc, those injuries get worse over time structurally, just structurally. They may not cause symptoms to get worse, but structurally they get worse over time. And this patient probably had herniated discs a long time ago, maybe in his, who knows, I'm just saying 20s, could be 30s, could be earlier. But over time, those herniations and the injuries to the disc got worse. The disc started to settle down and collapse, and there's been some sliding of the bones out of alignment, whether it's a twisting sliding, or it's a slipping forward and backward, or it's um, kind of um, f straightening of the spine. We call it kyphosis, which is what he has, and bone spurs have developed around the facet joints in the back of the disc. Long story short, these are typical degenerative changes seen in the spine. But really the same, it's really been the base core problem, the basic problem has been for causing his back pain and his leg symptoms has been the annular tear, herniation, and narrowing of the hole where the nerve comes out. And that gets worse over time. And some people put off treating it with surgery because they want to see if it gets better. But once you have chronic back pain from a herniated disc and you have leg symptoms from a herniated disc, if you've gone past eight weeks, the chance you're going to get better on your own is less than 1%. So there's a 99% chance if you have back pain from a herniated disc or leg symptoms from a herniated disc, that if you've gone past two months with your symptoms, they're just not going to get better on their own. You're going to need something done surgically to fix the problem. So that's the time when most people get referred to see a surgeon, and the surgeon talks about surgery. And then what are the surgeries available? Well, you've got literally about 30 different surgeries or maybe 50 different back surgeries, and you've got about probably about 10 different neck surgeries you could do. So obviously there's more opportunity to do surgeries, different types of surgeries for the lower back than there are for the neck. So, but in the end, um, you have all these different surgical choices. Well, which one's the right surgery for you? And obviously, when I first got done with residency, I struggled with the same question. Like, okay, I got a patient here with a herniated disc, and there's some stenosis, but what should I do? Like, what's the right surgery? And I get it. If I go back and rewind the clock, you know, for me, probably, what, 16 years now? If I go back 16 years since I've been in practice, since I graduated residency, I had those same questions in my mind. What's the right surgery for this patient? What's going to give them the best outcome? What's going to give them the best recovery? What's going to be the least um, risky to them of having a complication? And so every day I would worry about these things and worry about these things and worry about these things. And patient after patient, day after day, minute after minute, and then over time, what happened was I learned, after trying all these different surgeries, I learned which ones actually worked consistently. And I learned how to do the surgery so that it, I had consistently good results. And whenever I had a problem with an outcome, like I wasn't happy about a specific outcome, all right, I, I learned from that and I said, okay, how can I do it better the next time? And I made changes, and I've done literally thousands of changes over the last 22 years since I started doing neurosurgery in residency. 22 years, I've made thousands of changes in my surgical technique, and every single change has been not to make it easier for me, not to make it faster for me, but to make it better for the patient. And so what I'm really telling you, for those of you paying attention, 
and for those of you learning from this video in the future, is that a good person makes a good doctor. A good person makes a good surgeon. So if you read between the lines, and I'm making the lines big, I'm ex actually telling you, is that good people make, make good doctors, okay? Do good people make good stockbrokers? I won't comment on that. I have no idea. I would say probably no because the, the kind of that I get calls from are always lying about things. But what I can tell you is that there's a lot of bad doctors out there, okay? Yep, a lot of bad doctors. Hate me for saying it. If you're a doctor, I don't care. It's the truth, and you know it's the truth. There's a lot of bad doctors out there that have sold their souls. And I don't say they sold their souls after they finished their training. They probably sold their souls a long time ago, long before, you know. And if you look into the childhood of these people, you probably see ugliness and badness. And there's a lot of ugliness in the world. So there's a lot of ugly people in medicine. There's a lot of bad people in medicine and, and other fields as well. But we're talking about specifically spine surgery here. And I can tell you over the last 22 years what I've learned is that there are very few doctors that actually really care about their patient and their patient outcome. Most of the surgeons I know, they only care about themselves and their own image and um, maybe money, okay? And so that bothers me a lot because that's not what I thought I went in. I didn't go into medicine personally for that, but I thought all the doctors in medicine would be people like me you know, who put the patient first, who collaborated together to solve problems in medicine, to try to make medicine better, to make life better, to make health better, but that's not what I'm seeing. I see doctors that have sold out to insurance companies and will tell the, uh, the patients that they don't need treatment because they're actually getting a bonus for every patient they turn away from treatment. Uh, I've seen that over the years by the thousands you know, of course, pushed by insurance company, but that's no excuse for the doctor to accept the money and accept the offer. A doctor should always remain true to the patient they're treating, uh, and even patients that they're giving opinions on, whether they're not treating. So if I'm being hired to give my independent medical evaluation or my assessment on a case that isn't mine, I should be honest and truthful and always have the patient's best interest at heart. And that's what I think all doctors should be like, but they're not. So I'm making this statement because it's a statement of fact. I'm making this statement because it affects people's care. And people that are listening to this broadcast, I wish the whole world would listen and understand the truth. But people need to be very careful about where they go for their medical care. Okay, very, very, very careful. And the reason they need to be careful is number one, not all care is equal. And where you go matters. And a lot of the hospitals I see these days are really doing everything they can to save money. And what they're doing, it's amazing. They're cutting their spend on equipment for the patients, on medication, on everything. Basically staff, uh, equipment, drugs, everything. And we're seeing a deterioration in the quality of care being given at hospitals and by doctors all around the country. I don't know about the rest of the world, but this is in the United States. And that's where we're broadcasting from is Florida. So why is the hospitals cutting the quality? It's simple. The reimbursements they get from the insurance company are on the decline. So the insurance companies hold all the power and they basically tell the hospital, we're going to pay you less for that labor and delivery surgery. We're going to pay you less for that spine surgery. We used to pay you 40000 when or 50000 Now we're going to pay you 30000 And then a few years later, 20000 So they keep choking the life out of hospitals, out of surgery centers, out of doctor's offices by cutting the reimbursement. And if you say, screw you, I'm not taking your lower reimbursement, they drop you from the network, which is what Cigna has done for us, for example. And uh, because they drop you, um, you basically have to try to survive um, without it getting an insurance company to pay you. And that makes it a lot harder. So basically they make you starve for a little while. It's kind of like, you know, the old prison movies where they put you in that, that box, the hot box, you know. If you've been a bad prisoner, you're stirring up trouble. They throw you into isolation in this tin box out in the sun 
where it gets to be about 130 degrees and you burn your back and your body on uh, on the metal all right they're torturing you and that's what the insurance companies do they have so much power in this country they can just deny payment and that is the the thing we have to take away from them if we want to get medical care back to the high quality of care it should be so these insurance companies are paying hospitals less and saying take it or leave it and the hospitals are cutting the quality of care patients are getting and but the CEO still gets the same pay I can assure you of that I, I was the chief of staff at the hospital for years and I sat on all the board meetings I know exactly what went on and so what I'm trying to tell you folks is that you're not getting what you pay for and you're not getting what you deserve most places you go so that's why I'm trying to tell you be very careful where you go for your care don't believe that the system is going to take care of you because it's not taking care of you the system is abandoning you and it's abandoning you one person at a time and it's been doing it for the last 30 years and that's why there's so many sick people so many people with illnesses chronic illnesses that are not fixed you know you're told that back pain is not curable you're told that neck pain is not curable it's the lie it's a complete utter lie it is curable okay but part of the problem is the insurance companies don't want to pay for it the other part of the problem is most doctors aren't trained the same and so many of them can't cure you so you really have to go to someone who can everyone wants to be a spine surgeon every orthopedic surgeon that does spine wants to be a spine surgeon they choose that okay neurosurgeons want to do spine surgery but just because you want to do something doesn't mean you're able to do it properly well the best just because I want to be an Olympic athlete doesn't make me an Olympic athlete. Just because I want to be a Formula One race car driver doesn't make me a Formula One race car driver. I could never be a Formula One race car driver because I don't have the skills to do it. You know, it takes a very special, talented person to be good at certain things. And spine surgery, brain surgery is no different. That's why neurosurgeons are selected from the top of the class, from number one, number two, number top five in the class of 100 go and can have the opportunity to go into neurosurgery they don't all want to go to neurosurgery because it's very hard to do neurosurgery it's a long long road very painful um, to become a neurosurgeon but um, that's why the demands on the individual are so great that they only take the brightest the hardest working the people that have proven that they can make it so just because you're a neurosurgeon doesn't mean you're a good spine surgeon I know lots and lots and lots of neurosurgeons that are horrible spine surgeons. And um, so what I'm trying to say to you is if you really care about yourself or the person that you're thinking about with back or neck pain, choose the right place to get it fixed. It makes a world of difference in terms of the outcome. All right, first question, Zach. So somebody's asking me, Dr. Duke, to be able to get into Duke Spine and be seen and cared for, do we have to be referred? Or can you just take a patient self-referral? The answer is we take all people who come here. We don't turn anyone away. So no matter how you get here, we'll see you. Whether you're referred by a doctor or you're referred by yourself or a friend or a family member, you're welcome to come here. We, we literally, our belief is to help everyone. If I could somehow get every person with chronic back pain and neck pain in the door and and fix them i would do it tomorrow i would do it so we literally put down every obstacle and barrier we can i mean some people come here and say i have no money fix me we can't fix people without proper payment because everything we do costs a lot of money um i was telling somebody the other day one of my patients that the the screen, the TV screen in the operating room is like, it's, I think it's, it was 55 inch or 70 inch, I can't remember. But <laughs> that television monitor, when we first opened, we went to Best Buy and we bought one. It was 500 bucks. So we actually bought two of them for 500 bucks and 500 bucks. Put them on the wall. We then had the state came in and inspected our facility and they said, your facility is amazing, it's perfect, except you're not allowed to have those televisions in the operating room because they're not medical grade medical grade I said what the hell is medical grade television never heard of a medical grade television and um, they said well you gotta take them down and you gotta get medical grade television All right, well, where do we get that from here's some sites we can go get get it the television price 
for a medical grade TV was $10,000 per television. So I spent $20,000 on two televisions in the operating room, not to watch TV, but to watch this surgery so I could see in the endoscope. And uh, I could, I did originally buy them for a thousand. For two, I paid twenty thousand. So what does that tell you? It tells you how corrupt the system is, first of all, because you know people who have medical grade televisions are being way overpaid, and the rules and laws that support that are corrupt rules and laws. Because there's absolutely no benefit to having a medical grade television versus a non-medical grade. And when I asked the company what's the difference, they said, "Well, ours is just certified medical grade." I said, "Really?" So nothing else is different? Nope. There's no difference. Same plug, pretty much the same TV. A and it is corruption. It is absolute corruption. And it is hurting our company. It's hurting the patients. It drives the cost of medical care up. And so, yeah, everybody wants free care. I get it. I want to give everybody free care. But we get no donations from anyone. Uh, we have a foundation, a 501c3. You can get a tax break. Have we gotten a donation from Mark Zuckerberg? No. Have we gotten a donation from Bill Gates? No. Have we gotten a donation from, you know, Aunt Matilda? No. Nobody donates. Nobody wants to give money, and everybody wants everything for free. So that's where we draw the line. We don't do free surgery yet unless we have a donation from somebody that says, here's $10 million, go do 100 surgeries for free on people who are indigent. Yeah, we'd love to do that. You know, nothing would make me happier than not collecting money from patients. But the reality is, is that your insurance doesn't cover everything, and they're going to put you to a patient responsibility of some amount of money. And everybody's insurance is different. So I would love to not have to collect money, but right now in this day and age, we do. So we don't turn people away for any reason. Obviously, if somebody is morbidly obese and they weigh over 500 pounds, I can't do the surgery. Um, this is not possible. We don't have the equipment, and that's just too big, you know, for me to operate on safely. So aside from being too big, aside from being on death's doorstep, like literally on life support, aside from not having the finances to cover your responsibility, we don't turn anyone away that wants to come here, okay? We don't turn anyone away. Um, a lot of doctors these days are afraid to operate on patients with HIV or AIDS. We do. A lot of doctors are afraid to operate on people with hepatitis. We do. We don't turn people away for any reason, uh, except for those I've already mentioned. So, yeah, you don't need a, a doctor's referral. Just come. All right, so the question is, what model microscope do you use? So a great question. Um, just for everyone, we did not use a microscope during the surgery. We used an endoscope. Uh, so I don't know how to answer the question, if you meant endoscope or if you meant microscope. So I'll answer both. We do use an operating microscope. We have one here in the facility. It's called the Zeiss NC5, which is the latest best scope in the world for Zeiss for spine. So they have a spine model, which is doesn't have all the cranial uh, software for doing brain surgery, because we don't really do much brain surgery here, uh, very rare. Uh, but that being said, we don't have the need for the $500,000 extra platform for doing like brain tumor navigation surgery with fluorescence. So we just have the best spine microscope that you can buy in the world, and it's made by Zeiss, and it's a Pantera. And um, we use that for our anterior cervical discectomy infusion. We use that for our microdiscectomies when we have to do them. Um, and then for an endoscope, we use um, Linvitec, Linvitec endoscopy. And we have a couple of endoscopic towers. And we have a bunch of cameras. And uh, so yeah, endoscopic is Linvitec. And microscopy is Zeiss. Somebody's asking, what's my opinion on epidural steroid injections? My opinion is very favorable, despite all the bad publicity. I think people need to understand the truth, and this broadcast is about the truth. So let's address a few false information being promoted by the insurance companies. All right, of course, I want you all to understand something. When you see a topic come up in spine or medicine that's negative, it's in the news, it's in the news for a reason. 
It's not in the news because the news station is worried about your well-being and wants to inform you. It's in the news because somebody's paying for it to be in the news. So the opioid crisis, where did that come from? We've had an opioid crisis for the last 80 years. So like, why did it suddenly pop up? I don't know if you all remember Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes had an opioid crisis. He was addicted to opiates. He would go into his, uh, I forgot what they were called, the little opiate house, and he would uh, smoke uh, opium, all right? So this goes back a couple hundred years. So opium and narcotics, opiates, have been a problem in society for 200 years. Why is it being brought in the media now? And if you've listened to my broadcast, you know the answer. The answer is simple. The insurance companies pay billions of dollars a year for your prescription painkillers, yours. If they can make painkillers illegal or um, unfavorable in the public's eye by launching a massive campaign against painkillers, then what they can do is they can deny paying for them. And they're going to end up putting billions of dollars more into their profit line because they're not paying for your painkillers. Isn't it funny how the rise of medical marijuana for pain is happening at the same time as the opioid crisis? You think that's by chance? It's not. It's all by design from the insurance company, the health insurance company. What they're doing is they're saying, okay, folks, we're going to take away the painkillers that we have to pay for, and we're going to give you a new painkiller that you have to pay for. That's exactly what's being done. And it's all being dressed up and disguised as an opioid crisis suddenly and as medical marijuana becoming legalized for pain. Yep, you'll never get the insurance companies to pay for your medical marijuana, never. Why? Because it's illegal federally. Medical marijuana is illegal federally. Therefore, the insurance companies will never pay for it. So basically, the health insurance companies have transferred the cost of pain management, medical pain management, from them to you. And they're basically making all of you pay out of your pocket cash for medical marijuana, whereas they used to pay for narcotics to help you with your pain. So, yep, many people don't understand that. I have to explain it to them. It's very obvious to me. If you want to know the truth, just follow the money. So, do I believe in epidurals? Yes, I do. I 100% do. I think if someone has an irritated nerve root with leg pain or arm pain and they have a herniated disc, I think an epidural is a great opportunity to try to fix the problem with uh, injecting medicine that reduces inflammation right where the inflammation source is. That's the herniated disc and the irritated nerve. So yeah, I believe in epidurals. Um, I say that and I believe in epidurals, but they don't always work. They probably work maybe 50% of the time, and when they do work, they usually give people a few months of relief. But here's the situation. Imagine you're a teacher, right, and you're teaching class, and you've got two months left to go until summer break, and you start getting a herniated disc with arm pain, and you go get a cervical epidural. Well, that cervical epidural gives you relief so you can keep teaching for the next two months until school's out. Then maybe you get your surgery done at that time. The point is it buys people time because it gives them pain relief. And it's, it's not narcotic-based, so there's no addiction or anything that goes on with an epidural. Sure, some would argue, yes, it does give you some addiction. I agree there is an element, a psychological addiction, and perhaps a physiological addiction, but it's very low. On a scale of 1 to 10, it's probably a 1 or a 2, whereas the alternative of taking painkillers is more like an 8 or a 9 if they're narcotic. So... I'm not a proponent of narcotics, don't get me wrong. I'm a proponent of the truth. And the truth is, is that we do need narcotic painkillers for patients who have surgery. We do need narcotic painkillers for people who have broken arms and broken legs and, and have gone through trauma and they're in pain from the trauma. They need narcotics. And unfortunately, the insurance companies are so greedy that they want to keep their billions of dollars and not pay for your narcotics. They're going to take away all this narcotics and make all these people suffer unnecessarily. And that's shameful. And I can't do anything about it, folks, except educate you. And you know what? In the end, the truth is I have access to whatever I need, but you all don't. And so if you want to be healthy, if you want to be happy, if you want to be out of pain, then you are going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to fight 
the insurance companies to get them to pay for your care, your proper care, and stop trying to control medicine. They've taken a bigger and bigger role over the last 30 years, every year taking more and more control away from doctors and hospitals and taking control to themselves. And guess what? They're not going to pay for your medical care. They don't want to. All they want to do is collect your premium and not pay for your medical care so they can make more and more profit. They're literally out of control. Um, so all I can do is make you aware of the truth, whether you choose to believe it or whether you choose to act on it is up to you. My advice, you need to go to your senators and congressmen on a state level and you need to change the state laws and you need to take away the insurance company's ability to deny a doctor recommended treatment, whether it's a doctor or a chiropractor, um, you have to take away their ability to say no. All right, they should not have that power. They never used to, and medicine was really good, and doctors took good care of patients. Now, they have the ability to interfere and get in between the doctor and the patient and say, no, we're not going to authorize the MRI. We're not going to pay for the MRI. We're not going to pay for the treatment the doctor wants to do. That has to change. If it doesn't change, we're doomed. We're doomed completely from a health standpoint. We're doomed from medicine standpoint, and I think this is happening worldwide, by the way. All right, question? Do we use catheters for the laser surgery? Do we use catheters for the laser surgery? I assume you mean like a Foley catheter going into the bladder is what I would assume. The answer is no. We don't use any um, what's called urethral innovation where we put a catheter in for draining pee out. The reason is simple. We make our patients pee before surgery, and the surgeries are almost always less than two hours. I mean, I've never had one more than two hours, so as long as the surgery is less than two hours, you don't need a Foley catheter. That's the last question. That was our last question, and I've been able to spend a little bit of time trying to educate you about some of the socioeconomic issues going on in healthcare to make you more aware of who's to blame for the degradation of your health care. It's quite simply the insurance companies, and honestly, it's the hospitals for not standing up to them. Uh, it's the doctors for not effectively standing up to them. Uh, the most powerful doctor group in the United States of America was the uh, American Cardiology Association, and they were basically neutered about 10 years ago by the insurance industry, where the insurance industry cut their reimbursement on procedures massively and basically destabilized the entire cardiology medical field um, as a result of that. But here's the thing, without money, the uh, American Cardiology Association is, is basically paralyzed. And they can't get money from their members because the members aren't making any more money. They're basically making enough money to keep their offices open. So um, this is basically economic warfare of the insurance companies against the healthcare system. And the healthcare system is losing. Hospitals are closing at a record pace. Insurance companies are making record profits. Doctors are going out of private practice at a record rate. Uh, doctors are basically unable to get patients the health care they need. And I'm telling you folks, the public, you, you're the only hope we have. There is no other way. You have to use your voting right. You have to use your grassroots advocacy rights. And you have to get the laws changed so insurance companies cannot deny recommended medical care. It should be a decision of the patient and the doctor together and not anyone else, not any third party. All right, have a blessed day. It's Dr. Ari Duke Majin, CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. Hopefully you enjoyed the broadcast and learned something new.